Hello, all, and welcome to a special live stream presentation of Monstrosities. I'm your host, Matt, and uh, today is uh, actually pretty special. Um, you know, typically on here, as you all know, we cover tokusatsu, Japanese special effects films, live action television shows, all that jazz. But, you know, occasionally we like to dive into other aspects, especially when a member of the Monstrosities family does something extraordinarily cool. So it was really nice to celebrate that, dive into it, and such is an occasion today. Um, the book is Ruen Ling Yu, Her Life and Career, written by my good friend and a very familiar face here on Monstrosities, who also happens to be one of the founding members of Kaiju Masterclass and a, and a staff writer for Toho Kingdom. I got to give your Godzilla credentials for, for some people, you know, <laughs> Mr. Patrick Galvin. What is up, man? I'm doing very well, Matt. Thank you for having me. And thank you also for that wonderful book trailer that you made. You know, in case the viewers know that that trailer begins this that began this live stream was actually made by Matt. So thank you very much for that. And thank you well, for having me about this. Thank you for the, the compliments. For those who are watching at home currently, uh, be prepared. Like I, I am extraordinarily biased in this case. Patrick is a friend of mine. I was just telling him before the live stream that how amazed I was by this piece we're going to be talking about this so there's going to be a lot of perceived butt kissing but the thing is like it's, it's all coming from a genuine place um because as I told you Patrick uh I was pretty uh pretty in awe of this thing and, and I'll tell you why that is you know uh and and I think I can speak for some of my audience too which by the way I just want to say hello to some of the people in here we got RJ we got Doomzilla we got Paul Taggett who is in the chat and uh, the werewolf as well. So it's good to see you all, and Isabella as well. Um, but the hope is that you guys who are watching at home will go and pick this book up, right? But I think I can speak for a good chunk of my audience who are like, you know, yeah, sure, we might like film history, but the silent era of Chinese cinema is not exactly something I'm going to go out and explore. You know what I mean? But in this book, you make it so totally accessible, right? But it's not just a book about you know, Ron Ling Yu, it's, it's a, you, you encompass, let's go from the macro to the micro. It's, you, you have 25 years of world history, how that condenses down into the cultural history context of China, which goes into the, the film history of China, which is very interesting. And then down to this woman who is navigating all of this stuff. You know what I mean? There's political turmoil. It, it, it almost reads like a film itself, her life. And her life was extraordinarily short. Um, I just, uh, you know, I, I want to start off by asking, you know, what was it that captivated with this actress for you? Who is she? You know, like if you were to tell this to an audience, like who is she? What was it that just made you like, oh my god, I gotta, I gotta watch her work? Hmm. Well, uh, in short, Ruan Ling Yu was uh, one of the uh, major uh, film stars of China in the first, you know. Uh, 20 or 30 years of the 20th century in China, especially in Shanghai, where she worked throughout her entire career. And Shanghai was basically kind of like, you know, the the Hollywood of China at that time. Yeah, that's where the main film production center was most active, was in Shanghai during the 20s and the 30s, where she, where she was working. Um, what, what drove me to write a book about her? Well, as I write in the intro to my book, um, in 2018, I saw a film called uh, The Goddess from 1934, directed by Wu Yonggong, um, which is about a, uh, a single mother who works as a prostitute to provide a living for her, uh, her son, uh, tries, to, tries to send him to school so he can have a good education and have a good career and a good life. But both of them are being prejudiced, are being uh, discriminated against by society, who, who think very lowly of, you know, sex workers and their children. So the, so the children 
bear the brunt of society's biases towards their parents, which is unfortunately a reality in many parts of Asia, including China at that time. And uh, it was a powerful film, and I was really awestruck by her performance in particular. She just kind of had this, you know, magnetic, elegant presence, and she just made great acting look easy. She was one of those people who just made it look like it was like there was nothing to it, like anybody could do it. And I was fascinated by her immediately because of that. And uh, when I was doing some very basic research about her in the beginning, which basically means just, you know, IMDb and Wikipedia and just Googling her name and seeing what comes up, I was uh, sad to find out, as you mentioned, that she died before she was even 25 years old. Yeah. Uh, just two, she was, she died just, you know, t uh, less than two months shy of her 25th birthday. And at that moment, you know, having watched the film and being enamored with her cinematically, I had, I was kind of in that, you know, that starstruck mentality that, that we as fans always have from time to time, where we briefly forget that people from the film industry are just ordinary people themselves, essentially. And as a, as a starstruck fan at that time, I wanted to, I wanted to know why this woman who seemingly had everything, you know, she had talent, she had fame, she had beauty, she had success. I want to know why she was so unhappy with her life that she chose to end it before she, when she was so young. And that's basically what pushed me to do, uh, start learning more about her was I, I want to answer those basic questions of like, you know, I want to of course know more about her life and her career, but what pushed her to take her own life when she seemed to be at the pinnacle of her life, at least from a fan's perspective. And that's basically where the project started. Yeah. You know, you did, I, I should mention that we haven't linked to it in the description of this video and I will, uh, but you did a documentary a um, uh, couple years ago, back in 2019. It's actually the title of the book, Rami Ling Yu, Her Life and Career. Uh, and the book just is like a huge expansion upon all of that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that you really, um, you, you paint a, a really good picture about, you know, answering all those questions. A lot of this stuff, just for the audience at home, some of the details of her life, I think we're going to kind of keep, you know, at a, you know, not, not talk about too much. So you read the book because there's a lot in there, but you're also talking about just a time period of 25 years. You know, it's, it's just a, a blink of an eye on this planet, you know, but Patrick does a very good job of really exploring every detail of why things happen the way they did and stuff. And that kind of, um, kind of going to another aspect of this, you know, when I was talking before about how, you know, it's not just a biography of a person, but it's also, you know, a snapshot of history about what was happening within China. You know, you had the, the communists versus the nationalists at the time, uh, all the problems with the Japanese, um, uh, the film industry in general, which was, which was very like Wild West sounding. How difficult or not difficult was it um, to kind of like gather up all this information? You know what I mean? Because again, you're not just following one person. You're you're basically again. You offer this kind of timeline, twenty five years worth, and and how this affected her life and why certain things happened. But how difficult was that to put together? Because I, I can't imagine you just you know looked at a couple of run you books and were like, oh yeah, well I know all there is now. Because <laughs> you know? I mean, you really go in depth. You there's a lot of sources you you named and stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I should, I should say that uh, at the time uh, before, at the time, you know, I started and actually until the time I published my book, there was only one book about her written in English. And that was Richard J. Myers, uh, Ruan Ling Yu, Her Life and Career. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good, solid book. It was the primary source for my documentary that I made a couple of years ago. Um, but as it, and, but when I, and I read the book, it, I was very thankful to, to it for answering my questions about like why she committed suicide and gave, giving a good basic overview of her life and whatnot. But what really pushed me to do more extensive research was because while the book was very, very good, it was, as I describe it, a really good introduction to her life and her career because it's a pretty small book. Uh, the actual biography section is only about 60 or so pages. Um, and again, you know, good quality book, very well researched, very well, very well written. But I felt that, you know, given the, the impact of her life and her death that had, uh, that had on, you know, Chinese society, you know, decades after the fact, I thought there had to be a lot more information about her, and that's what and that was uh, what pushed me to do more extensive research. Initially, I had no intentions of writing a book. It was just to answer my own personal questions about, like, you know, want to know more about her and about her life, people she worked with, about her industry, and what, and so on and so forth. And uh, at, and in the course of doing that research, I learned 
a lot about the people she worked with and about her industry, the history of her industry, and the history of China in the early 20, in the early 20th century. And just by reading you know, little snippets about like say, oh, this director's uh, problems with the censors, for example, at this point in history, or the problems this film had with censorship at this point in history, or how this film was made at a time when, you know, say uh, the, the communists faced a huge uh, slaughter from the nationalists in Shanghai while Ramang Yu and her, and her film crew were off making a movie somewhere else. You know, just reading all these little snippets made me realize, you know, there is a lot of uh, connective tissue between her career, her the history of her industry, and the history of her country. And they were all kind of like, you know, interconnected and sort of, as you mentioned at the beginning, kind of playing off one another and kind of tying together constantly. And so to, in order to uh, properly put all these things into context, I meant I had to do, had to do a lot of research, learn a lot about uh, Chinese film history, about Chinese history, people she worked with. And so I dug up, you know, in addition to digging up, for example, uh, Chinese language books about Ruan Lingyu, I also dug up a whole bunch of books about just Chinese film history and Chinese history. There's a great book by Harriet Sargent about the history of Shanghai, which was extremely valuable in, in learning about these uh, key events that were happening. Also, Harriet Sargent, you know, did a really wonderful thing that was useful for me, which was that she was interviewing a lot of Ruan Lingyu's colleagues who were still alive at the time. Wow. Like she, inter she interviewed uh, Sun Yu, who was a wonderful, wonderful filmmaker who directed Ruan in a number of films, most of which are unfortunately now lost. But she interviewed him to get some perspective about, about why he made this film or that film. She wrote about the, about uh, Ruan Ling Yu's uh, legacy, the impact her career has. She interviewed like you know, close friends of hers. So she did a, she did a lot of great legwork that would that without which my book would not have been nearly as comprehensive. And you know that combined with all these other great historians who have done great research of their own through the, through their through reading their works and studying it and drawing all these connections and you know figuring out kind of like a timeline of how things like play out. As a result, I, I was able to put together a, uh, what I thought was basically a, a course of basically three stories. It was the story of China, it was the story of the film industry, and it was the story of Ruan Ling Yu. You know, I, that was not my intention when I started doing research was to figure this out. I only want to learn more about Ruan Ling Yu, but just by studying her and, her and her colleagues, I learned, I realized there was a lot more going on than just the story of her 24, almost 25 years of life. There was so much more going on, including things that that were going on before her and after her, you know, because the, the book, as you know, does not end immediately with her death. There's still some context that goes on after the fact, you know, things that were occurring during her lifetime that kept going on afterwards. So I had to do a, a lot of research and really educate myself a great deal about the history of China and Chinese film and his, history of Chinese film. So it was uh, it was not it was not a uh, easy task. It, it was quite difficult. It required a lot of reading and a lot of research, a lot of gathering of materials. But it was, uh, I think, uh, I think it really turned out well because, I, I, at least from from my perspective as the author, I thought I was able to put together a good portrait of you know what was going on in these three different areas at that time period. Absolutely, absolutely. Doomzilla actually asked, "How long did it take you to find incredible history of your life?" Yeah, I basically helped construct it myself. You know, by doing a lot of cross referencing. You know, books about history about history books about the film industry books about her and people she worked with you know and and by all these cross referencings i was able to put together a timeline and kind of figure out and actually i'll tell you this much you know when i was when i decided to write the book i started to uh document and categorize my research into a uh a document it served as kind of like an outline and it was only through that outline that i was able to figure out okay at this point i'd have to talk about what was happening politically at this point I have to talk about what was happening in the industry and whatnot and how and figure out how they were all they would all lead into one another so this book in a sense wasn't written organically the structure of it i had i had figured out you know pretty far in advance just by categorizing my research before i even started writing it so it was it was a lot it was a much more complicated process than you know than i expected when i just yeah. when i eventually decided to start writing this yeah, no, um, I, I think you do a very, you know, again, compelling job. I know that, and again, full disclosure, I'm very biased, you know, because I will always be supporting Patrick and no matter what he does. Um, but I think that uh, you, you just, I mean, everything there, you, you dedicate um, a good chunk actually, like to the early beginnings of her life, her mother and father in particular. Mm -hmm. And, 
you know, I'm not trying which to was, which, was, which was difficult because there's just not a whole lot that's known about right. her. And I, I can say it's because, you know, it's the beginning of the story, so it's not like a huge spoiler. Um, you know, she was the sole surviving child of a family of a family of what began as four. She had one older sister who died in infancy, you know, and her father died when she was only when she was quite young, when she was still, you know, very, very young. When, for, when she was like about, say, uh, like five, six, something like that. She was pretty, she was quite young. And so there's as a result, there isn't a whole lot of really detailed information about her early life. And so it was, again, through a lot of, you know, individual sources that I was able to put together, you know, somewhat of an idea of what was going on at that time in her life, you know, and that which was not easy whatsoever, because even Chinese language resources don't have a whole extensive amount of information about that particular time in her life. Because again, there's not a whole lot to go off after her father died when she was young. Her one sibling preceded her in death long before she even became well known. You know, so there, there wasn't a whole lot of, shall we say, testimony to go back to and figure out, okay, what happened here? What happened here? What happened here? So it was, you know, so I, I so I appreciate you saying that it was uh, detailed because I was trying to create, create as detailed as possible, um, well, uh, introduction to like the early parts of her life without, you know, fictionalizing it. So, so I, so I appreciate you saying that it that came across as detailed because that was my goal to make it feel that way based on what little is known about that part of her life. Yeah, it should also be mentioned too, and I'm kind of jumping around here, but you know, just because of the fact that there is a lot of unknown, and unfortunately, there's also a lot lost. You know, I mean, yes. she has, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, only nine surviving films of the thirty or so that she made, right? And only seven of which are presently available. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, and she I, made thirty. And she made thirty movies, which. You know, which gives you like a, and, and her career in a sense kind of like, you know, is like a, a small sample of what's been lost of vintage Asian cinema. You know, because, I mean, Grant, on the one hand, you know, a good chunk of Chinese and Chinese silent films. And we should mention she was, she only worked in silent movies. She never made any sound films. Um, and Grant, on the one hand, yeah, silent cinema, a good chunk of it is lost, you know, worldwide. But it's especially devastating in Asia because Asia was, you know, really hit hard by a number of things, including World War II. You know, and Shanghai was, in addition to being the film capital of China, was also the site where a lot of the, you know, bat conflicts with the Japanese in what led what became World War II took place. And then you have, you know, censorship by the nationalist government, then censorship by the uh, communist government, which comes after the fact, you know, in 1949. So all these things put together, then you have things like disposal fires and whatnot, a good chunk of Chinese silent film history is lost. And the fact that only nine of her 30 films survive is in a sense kind of like a sample of that in showing you know, how much of vintage Asian cinema has been lost. And this when we're talking, we're talking just about China right now. There's that applies also to Japan and Korea and whatnot. So it's a very unfortunate um, phenomenon, but it's and it's kind of represented through what little survives of her filmography. Yeah, no, it's, I think it's just an, kind of an important thing to bring up, you know. Um, it's, uh, the other important thing too, I think that, you know, we're, we're kind of like, we're not diving necessarily into her film career right yet, but I think something that I picked up on, and again, please correct me if I'm wrong, but it just, you really have to understand, I think, her life, how things were, her beginnings, what was happening behind the scenes and stuff. Because I think that really translates to even appreciating her performances so much more in the actual films themselves. Um, because like, so, and we'll get to it a little later, some of the events in the movies that she actually were in have very, very eerie parallels to, like, to her real life, you know, yeah. especially her end, which mm -hmm. is yes. just like whatever. So the unfortunate reality, I think, is when you're talking about this actress, and again, please correct me if I'm wrong, is you have to talk about this just sad. I mean, there, there is an era of sadness. I think that you, I mean, that's that phrase has been used to describe her acting before and everything too, mm -hmm. but there's the sadness and stuff that she experienced in her life, I think played such a huge role in what made her so captivating to, you know, you to write an entire book about her to, you know, the, the Chinese who watched her, you know what I mean? And here we are in the year 2022, almost 2023, a couple of Westerners talking about somebody who died in 1935 with only seven films available to watch. You know what I mean? So that's, that's, I think just for the people at home are just not like, you know, Oh, we're just like concentrating on the dramatics of it. 
her life is just filled with with that you know mm -hmm. um and uh i i i'm sorry <laughs> I'm making more statements and observations as opposed to asking you about this, but I, I, I'm going to try to form into a question, you know, but something that um, I felt like was really kind of coming out in your work is that uh, maybe outside of her father, the men in her life were awful. Yes. I mean, just, just <laughs> scumbags, absolute freaking scumbags. And uh, you know, there was this, uh, this cat, uh, is it, the Damien is that yeah Jean Damien yes Jean Damien yeah complicated relationship mm -hmm. I think that you captured that um, so well and uh, but it, it here you know this woman is a second class citizen right she's uh, she's supporting this man her mother her daughter herself you know she has this other affair on the side you know. And all of it's just bad for her. But the thing I think that comes out the most, and this kind of is tying back a little bit, I'm sorry I'm jumping around, but tying back to her early beginnings, is that the women that are presented in here from uh, Rouen back to her mother, especially her mother, you know, who was like working her fingers to the bone, literally trying to uh, provide an escape for, uh, for her daughter out of poverty. You know what I mean? And she actually succeeded in doing that. Yes. But I just, I was wondering if you kind of had similar observations when you were kind of examining her life, you know what I mean? Because I don't know how, I mean, you, you mentioned about, you know, how she really played a, played a role in like women's rights and stuff, but this, uh, this woman seems very selfless, you know, at least that's how it, it, it very much comes across. And I was just wondering if, if you've had, if you felt similarly when you were kind of examining Absolutely. her. Yes, absolutely. That's exactly how she comes across. She came, you know, by all every testimony that I uncovered about her, you know, always spoke very positive about her as a person. You know, with maybe the exception of uh, the wife of the studio boss for the first company she worked for, kind of had some not so flattering things to say about her in terms of as a professional. But everybody who spoke about her on a on a personal level always said she was very generous, very um, honest, very forthcoming. You know, and they always noticed how she, how sad she was at many points in her life. You know, she never she never really seemed to be blissfully overly happy. You know, it's just a, it, that's just the the air like I kept getting. You know, again and again throughout the uh, throughout my research. So yeah, she she did lead a, a very sad life behind the scenes, which played enormously into the her fa was an enormous factor behind why she chose to end her life when she was so young, and and seemingly as far as you know a fan was concerned. At the pinnacle of her life, but yeah, again, once you dig into the finer details of it, there, it really wasn't that whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's really something else. This is a very broad statement, and we you just said uh, behind the scenes that, that you could talk for eight hours about about her. But <laughs> can you just start talking just a little bit about her films? You know what I mean? What makes her captivating? Like, what was it about her acting that you know? not only spoke to the audiences at the time, but also speaks to the audiences of today. You know what I mean? Because obviously she, you know, captured, you know, your attention, you know, yeah. um, but what made her special as an actress and the films oh. that she acted in? Yeah. Uh, well, that's uh, best summarized uh, by a uh, statement that was given by, uh, there's a documentary called the story of film and odyssey made by a guy named Mark Cousins it came out about 10 or so years ago which has a small section devoted to uh, her legacy. And in that they interviewed some uh, Chinese film, uh, film goers who remembered that era of history. And one of them said something to the effect of like, you know, the reason why she resonated was because her films and the characters she played reflected China as it really was and Chinese social issues as they really were, especially for women. You know, in uh, most cases, not always, but in most cases, Ron Ling Yu was the cinematic embodiment of the suffrage of women in China at that time, you know, dealing with everything from sexism to, uh, well, yeah, largely, you know, sexism mainly at first of first and foremost, because, you know, women's rights in China then as now are not ideal. And, you know, she basically represented that in addition to things like poverty, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, perspective being caught between political wars between the nationalists and the communists, you know, her films reflected all these things, you know, as, as well as uh, in, as well as in some cases, like promoting hopes for improvements in the future. But in, in, in most cases, she was the embodiment of the suffering that came out of all those things. 
know, and she drew upon her real life experiences to make her performances so authentic. That's part of the reason why, I think why they resonate so well even today. You know, and and what's curious and what's interesting about her is also that you know, uh, silent film acting is kind of known for being very exaggerated and very theatrical, very over the top, like you know, broad sweeping gestures. You know, which comes across as very kind of hokey and dated by today's standards. Uh, Ruan Lemieux's perform uh, acting style wasn't like that whatsoever. She she Im imbued a very naturalistic, very realistic style of acting. Again, drawing from her real from her own experiences. You know, and actually, Mark Cousins, who made the documentary that I mentioned earlier, in his in his narration, he talks about how she how while, whereas Marlon Brando is often credited for introducing realistic film acting in America. Ruan Ling Yu was doing the exact same thing decades before he even appeared on the scene. So that's also a big reason why I think she uh, still resonates today. And, and by all means, there were, there were not all, not all actresses of that time period were like that. You know, other actresses had different kinds of, you know, shall we say images, you know, Li Li Li, who was in many of Ruan's films was the, the total opposite. She was the quote unquote big sister. She was the uh, embodiment of the great leap forward, you know, the, perpetually positive, super optimistic figure. So Ruan Lingyu was not, you know, one of many who was doing this kind of thing. She, that was kind of like, you know, her image was this embodiment of suffering. And the way she delivered it was a big reason why she resonated so much with audiences then, and I would say still to this day. You know, I have not watched any of her films, you know. I will be completely honest with you. The closest I've gotten was when we were putting together the book trailer and you were giving me you know, hey, use this session from that, this session from that, like here's a list of, of stuff. But just going based off of what you said, I mean, you can completely see that in her acting. You know what I mean? You can just, it's subtle. Um, it does come off as real. And it, it's not that kind of grandiose, almost stage-like things, I think, that we sometimes associate, at least here in the West, with those kinds of films, you know? Um, because there is a lot of subtlety in it. Um, which I find interesting because she was trained for stage, you know, so I, I would think that the big sweeping motions would just come naturally, but there, there is a lot of realism just in those looks, you know, and, and, um, I had, I think you're going to remind me what this is from. I brought it up because this is a famous scene. Uh, where is it? It's the, this one right here. With, that's it's, that's it's, uh, from the goddess. Yeah. Yeah, and it, that was like, did, was that one take? I'm trying to remember from the book. That I don't know. Was... I don't know uh, how many takes was used to get that to get that final to get this shot. But um, is that what you're asking? How many shots? How well, many no, takes? it's just her acting in that scene in particular. I thought was just it's it's just really good. So yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. That's 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 all the point I was I was making. Um, you know, the, uh, the other fascinating thing that I really enjoyed, and I was mentioning this before, is just kind of like the film history aspect of it. You know, I mean. Obviously, you cover her career and you, you you know, talk about, you know, the players and stuff that she goes to. But, I mean, she went to um, three different film studios. Yes. And um, forgive me if I, again, pronounce their their names wrong, but it was Ming Zing. Was that the first one? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then she left to do, and this one I'm going to really screw up, the Da Zonghua Bai Film Company. Did I screw that up? That's 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 close. Okay. <laughs> as long as I'm close and not completely, you know, like in some other. It, it's okay. Like like I said before the chat, like you know, my Chinese pronunciation is you know atrocious, so I I would I would butcher it very badly myself. So I'm just I'm probably just slightly better than you are. So again, a native speaker, a native speaker, or anybody who's like you know formally studied this would look would listen to either of us and say wrong, 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 wrong. Right. So, right. Yeah. 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 We're, we're trying our best, you know, I don't you know. Chinese has so many different like, you know, tones and pitches and whatnot. It's, it's, it's a pretty complicated uh, language to pronounce. So, uh, so it's, it's okay. Don't, don't feel bad. I, I'm, I'm butchering it myself whenever I even say her name. So, <laughs> well, I, I, I appreciate the, uh, the support. Um, but like, uh, I, I've mentioned it before, but I, I enjoy the fact that you really give a cool snapshot about how the studio systems were set up at the time. And also the major differences between these studios. The reason I was bringing this up is because in the second uh, uh, company that she went to, you were kind of story where I believe it was on um, it was on the same film. There was a 15 year old actress who was injured from a fall and was given a day to recover. And then not long after that, she was nearly burned alive. <laughs> and yeah. 
it's awful, but it also really is an example of kind of like the, again, the wild west nature, the money snatching aspects, which you, you describe in the book. Yeah. And, and, and at that time, you know, the film studios didn't really, didn't, didn't really hardly ever use uh, stunt doubles. So in a lot of cases, you know, especially in making a martial arts film, which was the case of that film, it's one of the, it's a, one of the nine dragons films that she, you know, nine dragons being a title, not a, not a, not a description uh, that she made for Dajong by a, uh, in which case, you know, the actors, if they needed to like, you know, say jump out of a tree, they had to do it themselves. They had to be like, you know, uh, tied into a construct and have the fire set in front of them. They had to actually be in the construct themselves. If they were being hauled around on cables, that was them and not, not a stunt person in most cases. So it was, you know, very, very, very dangerous work. And that's actually why some people, switched careers within the industry like for example close friend of Ron Ling Yu's was a cinematographer who That's started right. out as an actor and became disenchanted by the perils forced upon um actors when they're making martial arts films so that's why he moved his uh career behind the camera became a cameraman instead so yeah it was a it was a it, yeah it really was like a, a wild west kind of situation especially since you know these uh film studios did not have nearly as much um money and whatnot as their counterparts in Hollywood. Yeah, so yeah, they, and you're also kind of jumping around here, but like you also really give a, a really good um, depiction of, of how the Chinese market was being flooded with foreign stuff, how that was affecting the studios, how they yes. had to team up in some cases. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask if just during your research, if there was, and this is more of a personal question, was there a particular studio or instance in that history that you found kind of like the most fascinating to write about? Oh, Lian Hua, which was where she was at for the later part of her career, um, was by far the most fascinating because they were the ones who got the, became the most progressive in figuring out, okay, you know, at, at this point in history, like, you know, audiences are kind of like moving away from Chinese films. They're more interested in like, you know, these lavish Hollywood films that have great production values and these big, you know, you know, male film stars and female film stars, and these more interesting stories and whatnot. And the producers at Lian Hua realized, okay, you know, if Chinese cinema is to survive and compete against this, that means we have to up, we have to up our game a little bit. We have to put more money into these films. We have to build more interesting sets. We have to have better directors, which was a key thing. Like, you know, for example, Sun Yu, who I mentioned. Sun Yu was, he often claimed, I don't know if it's true or not, but he claimed that he was the first Chinese director to study abroad. You know, he went after he graduated university in China, he went to the University of Wisconsin uh, to uh, translate poetry. And then he moved to New York to study, you know, film to study film courses at Columbia University. He studied drama in at New York. He studied uh, photography and whatnot. So he actually went to the country which was pioneering, you know, cinema and was and whatnot and brought his knowledge back to back with him to uh, China. And so when Lian Hua was forming, you know, one of the founders realized, oh, hey, he's precisely the kind, of, the kind of director that we need to help, you know, boost the appeal of Chinese cinema. So, yeah, they were very progressive on that, on that front, especially. And for that, I thought, I thought they were, they were in particular very, very interesting to learn about. So, yeah, of the, of the three companies she worked with, that one was by far the most interesting. That one also has the most interesting characters behind the scenes who were, um, you know, players in the history of Chinese film at that time. You know, Luo Mingyao, who was the uh, one of the big founders, and what in particular, you know, there was a lot, you know, especially since, since he had ties to the nationalist government and whatnot. So again, the history of Lian Hua is kind of, is very fascinating and how that ties into the government and the political tussles between the nationalists and the communists at that time you know, and whatnot. So there's a, it's a lot of connective tissue, which again, I think makes kind of a, a fascinating story. Like, you know, if I were to sell this book to somebody it's basically three stories at once. It's the story of Ruan Ling Yu, the story of her industry, the story of China in the early 20th century. It's those three things running concurrently. So yeah, and Lian Hua was, you know, for the reason I just mentioned, you know, a particularly fascinating, you know, corporate entity to learn about. Yes. Yeah. No, I, I, I definitely agree. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about some of the movies that she made underneath that banner, because, um, I think they they tended to be uh, the most famous, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, because uh, yes. I, I believe like the goddess and New Woman were underneath that. Um, yes, all all, all of her all of her surviving films were produced by Lian Hua. None of the films she made for the two previous studios survived, as far as we know. 
can you just tell the audience just a little i mean again i know that there's a they can go and buy the book but just to tell them a little bit about these films because a lot of them again you mentioned that they were progressive you know and they tackled some pretty heavy subjects these weren't just like these you know thoughtless romance movies you know i mean some of them yeah. were very uh sometimes creatively so heavy-handed in terms of the political commentary or stuff like that you know trying to get past censors and whatnot mm -hmm. yeah that's, that's that's absolutely true like you know her first film studio ming jing mostly made these confucian stories about like you know female chastity and whatnot and family ties and whatnot they didn't really try to be very progressive and actually you know one of the founders of ming jing uh, Zhang Zhengkuo, who was uh, very much interested in social policies, he would make these films that on the surface seemed to be, you know, pushing the envelope, but then would always dial back to a, to a play it safe ending, thereby kind of rendering his message kind of like, you know, moot and pointless at the end. And, you know, and Da Zhuang Abaye mostly just made, you know, you know flashy, silly uh, martial arts films. Lian Hua was the studio where we, where we saw more interest in, like, you know, say, real social issues. Like, for example, her first film for them was uh, a big two and a half hour romantic epic called Love and Duty, which dealt with topics like, you know, the wish for young Chinese to marry who they wanted to, not marry who their parents chose for them. You know, and the consequences being forced upon, say, you know, children as perceived by their parents. Like, How do their parents' reputation affect them? You know, that's a, a, a point that's brought up in the course of the story. Uh, you had films, for example, like uh, Peach Girl, which is a pretty mediocre film, but also deals with that same topic of, you know, people wanting to marry who they want to, which is which as opposed to letting the matchmakers and their parents decide. You had The Goddess, for example, which I just mentioned. You had a film called Little Toys, which was very much a film made for a time when the uh, Chinese filmmakers and the greater Chinese were kind of questioning the, whether the questioning the policies of the nationalist government, especially after the Japanese bomb Shanghai, you know, and people and people and so there would make there'd be these filmmakers who would raise these films, kind of <clears throat> excuse me, kind of questioning the status quo of the nationalist government and whatnot, and they would have to like work around the censors. And little toy for little toys, for example, is a film that is. Even though they do not state it directly, it's very clearly a movie about the Japanese and their and the Jap invading Japanese armies and the horrors inflicted upon the working class Chinese. You know, again, Japan is not named specifically in the film, but that's very clearly what it's about. Right. So you have things like that. You have um, her second to last film, New Women, which is all about women's suffrage and women's rights and the uh, struggle of women to find emancipation because. At this point in history, it's it's very clear that you know emancipation for women in China is very superficial, and so this is a film calling for real emancipation and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of interesting social contexts that are going on in the course of her films that, again, as I mentioned earlier, kind of are kind of reflecting what was going on in China at that time. So we see that through her movies, which is a big part of why she was so popular and why her films remain so interesting. Yeah, yeah, no, I can I can definitely definitely see that um you know i i don't know if there's much that i i just think that we've already kind of talked about this but i do think that we should make mention of it at the very least but there's a lot of eerie similarities i don't really know another word to describe it between um new woman the goddess and then her own life you know uh kind of like what happened how it played out and stuff of that nature um did you uh, this this is going to be the dumbest question of, of the of the interview i think but like how did you find that eerie i mean was that was that something that was just like oh that's just a coincidence or whatnot but i mean some of the the plot descriptions and things of that nature even um i think a little bit from her own upbringing like with her mother and stuff you know kind of like what her mother had to go through granted her mother wasn't like a prostitute trying to to give her you know child a better life but there's still some similarities there i would argue um did you find a lot of that or was it just in those two films did you find it strange i mean again i know that's kind of a weird question to ask but it's something that i wanted to talk to you about whether personally or publicly like we're doing right now 
Because it oh, is. Yeah, it there, is yeah, there, were, there were some cases where, like, you know, the events that were transpiring in the plots of her films were just very, very similar. What was going, what ha happened to her in her real life? There's a, a lost film called Life, for example, which was direct, which was the directorial debut of a guy named. Uh, Oh, I'm blanking on his name, but he later made uh, Spring in a Small Town, which some consider to be the greatest Chinese film of all time. Um, you know, and and the uh, the tribulations that Ruan Ling Yu's character goes through in that story have very, very eerie similarities to what happened to her in her real life in the early parts of her life before she became an actress. So, yeah, at, at times it, it was very, very, you know, strange, almost like it was preordained. And then there were other cases where, like, Cases where, like, yeah, it's um, the similarities to real events are obviously intentional in parts of the filmmakers in terms, of, like, you know, the political stuff and of course, yeah. social issues and whatnot. So, yeah, it was definitely a mix of both for sure. Nah, yeah, it's just I, I just found that I found that very fascinating. It just she her life is just a very magnificent one, you know, but magnificent in its beauty and magnificent in its tragedy. That sounds very grandiose and dramatic. But, oh, and, and, uh, and yeah. Fei Mu, I just thought Fei Mu was the name was the name of the director. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, wanted to like, it, it, she. Sorry, I'm looking at my notes here, just real quick here. Um, in trying to sell people on this book, and this is something that you know I don't typically uh, we don't typically talk about on this channel because of of all the reasons why we shouldn't, but it's like political stuff, right? Um, but something, you know, we've talked about how, you know, this is a fantastic biography of the woman's life, how this is a fantastic historical document in terms of China um, during that time, its film industry during that time. Um, but I think that if, if people want to look a little bit deeper, uh, just kind of like a, as in her life in general, I do unfortunately think that there's actually a lot of relevant issues that she faced, you know, back in 1935 and prior that are relevant even to this day, you know, we don't have to get into specifics, but Absolutely. a lot of it is heartbreaking. A lot of, a lot of it is just, I mean, it's incredible, but actually I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say this, um, um, a couple months ago, uh, shortly after the assassination of Abe Shinzo, who was the prime minister, ex prime minister of Japan, you know, very famously shot to death in public, you know, this yeah. year, um, there was actually a uh, Chinese journalist, female journalist, who wrote, I think it was on social media, I could be wrong, who wrote a piece that was expressing sympathy for the fact that Abe was killed. And given the fact that, you know, Abe had a very, shall we say, controversial outlook towards, you know, Japan's past history with countries like China, for example, uh, this this, this uh, reporter got, you know, a ton of, you know, hate mail, backlash went out on social media to the point where she actually attempted suicide. And and as you read the book, that's actually also a factor into why Ruan Ling Yu committed, her, committed suicide herself in, the 19, in 1935. You know, and I, I won't give any more details, but there are incidents that I mentioned towards the end of the book where other film stars since Ruan Ling Yu have faced similar predicaments. As, re as recently as the early 20th, 21st century. So yeah, it's, I, you are absolutely right. You know, a lot of the things that she faced and dealt with and that were so integral to her self-destruction are absolutely, unfortunately, still relevant to this day. This is gonna be a loaded question, might be a big question, but even though her life was incredibly short, you know, not even, I mean, two weeks shy of 25 years, you know, quarter century on this earth, which is nothing. Um, you having written this book, having looked at this and again, examined her life, was there any wisdom or lessons that you personally pulled, you know, from her just being about life in general or whatever, but was there any, anything that you kind of drew from that on a personal level? Uh, I don't know if, if, I, if I learned anything new, but it, it really did reemphasize some things that I previously knew, which is that, you know, again, you know, famous people, you know, when we see them on screen, we're kind of whisked away to that, to that starstruck mentality where we momentarily forget that they are just people themselves who have their own lives and their own lives are not necessarily glitz and glamour like they appear to be on screen or at least in a public image. You know, that's more that it's more complicated than that. 
that some sometimes famous people deal with um, real behind the scenes tribulations that people around the world, ordinary people, non famous people experience as well. You know, she had a lot of she had a lot of trouble in her personal life with the, with the men that she was involved with. You know, you know um, her common law husband, a man that she was involved with afterwards, a filmmaker that she fell in love with but never was able to be with. You know. And all these, all these things just, just kind of point up to the fact that we all know, which is that, you know, life is complicated. And for some people, life just never seems to get better. I think that's what I, what I mainly took away from it. And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're a commoner or if you're a famous person. That's uh, what, what I think was really, what I was really reemphasized to me in learning about Ruan Yu and the course of her tragically short life. Very much so. What's your favorite Ron Ling Yu film? My favorite Ron Ling Yu film is the first film of hers that I saw, which is The Goddess. I've seen it probably 10 times since that screening in 2018, and I love it more and more every single time I see it. It's a very powerful film. It's, it's very tight and compact. Great story. It's a first-time directing job, but you'd almost never guess by how, by how nearly immaculate it is. It has something to say. It's very thoughtful. It's beautifully acted, not only by her, but by her co-stars. You know, and it's one of those it's one of those fascinating films that chooses not to give its characters actual names, but you still know exactly who they are because they because it details them as people. They don't have to have a name to be relatable. It's one of those kind of films. And it's just absolutely powerful and mesmerizing. It's her greatest performance of her extent work, in my opinion. And I love it. And I, I've actually, you know, I don't take top ten lists that seriously, but it might be one of my ten favorite films of all time. Really? That's awesome. Um, if I were to write a bunch of smart films after that, you know, New Women, which she made uh, afterwards, which deals with, you know, sexism and the very superficial emancipation of women in China is also a very good film directed by uh, Sai Chu Sheng. Uh, the two and a half hour, two and a half hour epic um, Love and Duty directed by Bu Wong Kong is very good. Um, you know, the, and the unfortunate thing about Rolling Yu is, like, as again, I mentioned, like, you know, so many of her films are lost. And unfortunately, some of the films... And some of those films I really, really wish were still around, not only just because they were part of film history and part of her life, but because they sound so interesting and so integral to the development of her career. Like, you know, Spring Dream in the Old Capital is an example. Her first film was Soon You. Uh, that's uh, the, the film she made after that called Wild Flowers, which is also, which is also uh, a Lian Hua film directed by Soon You. You know, those two films in particular I really wish were still around. Also a movie called um, uh, Three Modern Women, which was which she played the opposite of her usual character. She did not play a victim. She played a take charge, um, revolutionary character in that film. A woman who was thrown into the slums, into the dirt poor poverty, and said, "Hey, I'm not going to stand for this. I'm going to build a better life for myself and for fellow proletariats." But that is the total, complete opposite of her usual screen image. And I really wish that film was still around today, so we could see that and see where Ron Ling Yu work against her usual screen image. Totally. So, so, so I, 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 so I have favorite lost projects of, of hers as well, you know, because she had a really fascinating career, you know, and you know, just reading more and more about the plot synopses and the filmmakers' intentions, what direct, what Bu Wong Kong hoped he, he could do with that film, Three Modern Women, you know, it just makes me all the more sad that you know, t more than two thirds of her career is unfortunately, as far as we know, lost. You know, although there is a slight hope that some of those films may turn up again. You know, for example, Love and Duty was thought to have been a lost film for a long time until, I believe, the mid-90s when a copy of it was found in Uruguay. And wow. it has since been, since been beautifully restored and released on Blu-ray in China. And what was nice about that was that, you know, uh, with that Blu-ray is that, you know, in Love and Duty is that back in the early 30s, uh, Li and Hua released their films with bilingual intertitles. So with Chinese and on the top and English on the bottom. So if you're curious... If you have a region-free Blu-ray player, you can actually get that Blu-ray, and you don't and you don't, you don't need subtitles to follow the dialogue because it's all already translated through the intertitles, and it's a, it's a great, great, great restoration. There's a couple of points here and there where there is some permanent damage that obviously they could not fix, no matter what they did. But it's it's one of the most spectacular restorations I've seen for a silent film in my life, and I'm glad that film not only survives but has been given a great restoration. I was going to talk about that, uh, just about kind of like the possibilities of some of these lost films. And, and it's not just with her movies. I guess it's just in general, because, again, you had mentioned how all of Asia basically suffered from 
you know, these calamities that destroyed these things is, um, is this a, and I'm admitting full ignorance on the matter. Is it a rarity for something like that to occur where like, you know, they find a, a film in some vault in Brazil, for instance, you know what I mean? Does it happen often? And, you know, what do you suppose the chances are for, you know, potentially more of like news work to still actually exist out there somewhere in the world? Um, it doesn't happen as much as it should, but it happens enough to give you hope. That's the best Fair way enough. to get you. you know, because, you know, again, that, that film was believed to have been lost for decades and it survived somewhere. So that, that, is, that has happened before. So, so to all my fellow silent film film fans out there, if you're still if you still have hope for say London after midnight to turn up, yeah, it might it seems to be gone forever, but you know we can still hold out some hope that perhaps there is a copy somewhere in the world and just yeah. be found. So yeah, it doesn't doesn't happen as much as doesn't happen as much as it should, but enough to give us hope for other films. Absolutely, it's fair enough. It's fair enough. Is um, this is another question I had, but I think you already kind of answered answered it. Would um, the goddess or new woman be your recommendations for people who wanted to say check out her work yes absolutely I, i'd start with the goddess it's her, it's her best film it's her best made film in my opinion and it's a nice really compact story and it's her it's her best uh, performance so i think that's the one i would really start with then new women for sure definitely definitely this uh we're, we're kind of moving away from the subject and, and talking more so about the book process. And the reason I'm asking you this is because I do think that there might be some people that watch this that actually want to, you know, write or stuff. Yeah. But but what was really cool about this um, was that you actually self-published this. Um, but I, I was wondering if you just kind of talk about the process, because even our friend Norman England is like looking into doing that, like you've inspired him to like start thinking about stuff. And I just think it's a really cool process because I mean, it's a, it's just, has a beautiful layout, you know. There's some artwork by our boy uh, Raf and yeah. Jemma right there. Yep. Um, but just, uh, you know, can you just talk a little bit about the process of putting a piece like that together? Because I mean, obviously, it's not necessarily like a super easy thing, but I think it's more accessible to people than you know just trying to get it published through some house or something. Yeah. Well. Uh, well. First of all, I should say I owe a tremendous amount of debt to John Lee May. Uh, who uh, you know has published a large number of books under his own name, who I've written for in the past. I, I wrote I wrote a couple articles for his Lost Films fanzine, which is actually I wrote a piece about Rumbling Yu's film Spring Dream: The Old Capital for issue four of his magazine. Um, but yeah, John uh, has been doing this, you know, has done this numerous times, and so he was and he was very um, kind enough to basically show me the ropes of how to how to format the document, get it ready for. For publishing, you know what kind of file, what kind of file to submit, you know how to get a cover calculated and whatnot. You know the great thing is that there was, um, you know, if you have like say Microsoft Word or whatnot, and you know there's some free tools on the internet which calculate, for example, like you know your cover size and whatnot for you. Right. Um, you know it's uh, it's a lot easier to it's a lot easier today because there's a lot of a lot of uh, tools available. And with Amazon, you can do a paperback or a hardcover and whatnot. You can do a Kindle version as well, which I've done as a the book yep. is available on. In paperback as well as Kindle, so there's there's a lot of great tools at your disposal. It's just more a matter of just you know having some tutorials or somebody who has some experience with it to show you the ropes of how it works out. So it's a, but yeah, it's a it's a it's a not you know instantaneous, but there's but it's a lot easier than you might suspect it might be. Is a, no, I, and thank you for want more than that, or is that good enough? <laughs> no, 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 no. That's good. Like I said, I know, I know it's kind of just random out there. But I do think that it's um, I do think it's inspiring that you're able to basically just you know conjure all this stuff by yourself and put this out there. Yeah, you know? and I should say the other thing with uh, with Amazon is the fact that you know people go to Amazon for their for their uh, merchandise these days primarily. You know, bookstores and libraries, yeah, they're still around, but they're kind of a, kind of a dying industry at this point. Yeah. But people all the time just go on Amazon looking for content related to the, related to their interests. So if you if you have a nonfiction if you have a nonfiction topic that you can write about and there's no major copyright issues, you know, in my case I was quite fortunate. Uh, Ron Ling Yu's surviving films, uh, with the exception of Love and Duty, are out of copyright, so I could use screenshots of her films without any um, legal issues whatsoever. Um, but if you have a topic that you can write about in that kind of way, with no um, issues of you're running into rights uh, rights um, conflicts and whatnot. 
um, you can you can put it out there and people who share your interests might just Google your topic and voila, it turns up that way. It turns up in their, in their search engine. So you don't always have to go to um, a library or a bookstore or through a publisher's catalog to get to uh, get content these days. You just go to Amazon. So Amazon makes it a little, it helps make it a little more accessible for people who are publishing themselves. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, thank you for expanding on that. Like I said, I know it's a little off topic, but I, I think that it's useful information for people who, you know, are looking to kind of get into that game here, you know. Um, as we're uh, kind of close to wrapping up here, I was just wondering, um, I know you've taken a much deserved break from putting together the book, but I was uh, curious if um, you had any uh, upcoming projects or maybe maybe you can tantalize us with something that you might be putting, you know, you have your eye on, but, you know, or something of that nature. Well, uh, I, I did recently publish my first post book essay. I wrote an essay about Case Gay Kinoshita's film Marriage um, for Our Culture Mag. It's a film that, that's set in the uh, occupation era of Japan. It's a film that, you know, kind of that kind of reflects what was happening in Japan at that time. And so I wrote, I wrote an article uh, detailing that for Our Culture Mag. That's, that's been my first and only thing I've published since finishing the book. And uh, yeah, I do have some um, other topics that I would like to explore in essence. I'm not doing any more, any more books for the moment, just because this was a big undertaking. And I kind of, and I kind of, and and writing essays is not as demanding, and not as strenuous, and not as time consuming as a 200 plus page book. But um, yeah, I, de I definitely want to write. I'm definitely going to be uh, publishing more um, articles and essays on various film topics um, in the future. And uh, and who knows, maybe there'll be a second book coming along, you know, sometime in the future. I don't know. There better be. I was already telling you. I, I'm just going to keep on, like, harassing you to uh, – because we need we need more stuff like this. But, you know, we'll, we'll always – I'm always trying to figure out ways to implement you to uh, use you as a interview subject on here. So, you know, whatever whatever you got, people will read, man. Like, I, I always love reading your work, and I don't care who knows that. It's uh, – you're – as far as I'm concerned, you're one of the premier writers of uh, – not only the tokusatsu genre, but, you know, in just Asian films. So I appreciate all the, the time and effort that you put into this stuff because we all benefit greatly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, Doomzilla had uh, just one question. I don't know this. Is there a region-free Blu-ray player without modding? Do you know? I, don't, I, I, think, I think what he's asking is, you know, I'm not sure what he's asking, to be perfectly honest. I know with some Blu-ray players you can change the region code by hacking into them but yeah region free blu-ray player doesn't require you to hack into it because it just plays blu-rays from anywhere in the world yeah you just, like, you just go on amazon and buy a region free blu-ray player or maybe see if somebody i, I don't know i actually i should say i don't know i don't know if uh best buy would carry them maybe they don't but you can but you can look into it I man you don't you don't have to hack into anything to get a region free player to play a chinese blu-ray because it just does it already Right, right. Yeah, at the top of my head, I'm not really quite sure. Um, I do know I've run into that problem with some Blu-rays myself, but I have a external Blu-ray writer um, that can actually read it reads region like all regions on there. But like, it's not a, something I would necessarily recommend. But it is out there, like Patrick said, Doom. So, if anybody has any questions in the chat for Patrick, please by all means ask, because we are soon about to wrap up this stream here but once again before we go the book is Ron Ling Yu Her Life and Career it's available on Amazon great freaking read I've said that about 50,000 times here available in both paperback as well as Kindle if you're a Kindle reader you can get it that way too that's true yes yes I, I always got to have the physical copy I'm, I'm gonna yeah I'm, I'm the same way I, I, I physically can't read a book on a mobile device my eyes get tired and I just can't do it but if I did I, go I, Kindle I, though I, I tell you what like like all of this would I mean, have a lot more space you know and, <laughs> and that kind of crap um, yeah but I do know that there are a large number of people who do prefer to read books on a, on a mobile device and I want the book to be available to that demographic as well so yeah absolutely I wanted to make the book available in that format as well. So yeah, again, if you prefer to read on your tablet or your phone or whatnot, you can get the book on Kindle through Amazon as well. And please guys go and buy it. Um, there's a lot to take away from it. Like I said, even if you don't know a thing about uh, the silent era of cinema in China, uh, Patrick gives a perfect just snapshot of it. Um, and just a, a beautiful, I mean, you're, you don't have to go into this read 
with any prior knowledge of the subject matter um because he's got you covered it is a, a wonderful read and really honestly patrick and something that i should, probably should have mentioned at the top um instead of just like right now but i think that um you know as a fan of rowan Lingun's work i think that this is also just kind of a true testament to the passion that you have for her contributions for film you know what i mean and i think that uh again being as meticulous as you possibly can be um with her life i, I just i felt like you covered every aspect as best as you could. You know what I mean? Like as you tried to literally go to every corner that you could f try to gather stuff, you know, and it's just a, uh, it's just a really beautiful piece of work. So I, I appreciate you for doing this. And also Doomzilla says still congrats on your book, Patrick. It was a huge undertaking, but you deserve mad respect in completing it. So. Thank you. Thank you, Doomzilla. Um, is there anything else you would like to plug, say, cover? Like, you know, we, we could keep going if, if you, there's more things you'd like to talk about. Because I don't want to cut you short. But um, is there anything else you would like to uh, say? Uh, no, just uh, thank you to everybody who has expressed interest in the book. Thank you to everybody who has supported it so far. Uh, thank you to everybody who decides to purchase and read it in the future. Um, you know, I, I spent, uh, you know, it was, you know, nine months of nights and weekends working on it. It was a labor of love, but uh, I'm very proud of the final result. I hope that people find it interesting and hope they find the story of Ron Ling Yu interesting. I, th I think even if you're not really into Asian cinema, but you're just, but if you're interested in say like, you know, the, the plights that women face, especially in part, especially in that part of the world, this would be a fascinating read. I think her story is appealing to people who just are interested in human stories as well as, you know, social stories and stories about what was happening at various points in history. It's not just a story of a film actress. It's a story of multiple things that were all happening concurrently. I, th I think that's what makes the book, you know, um, I think it would, make, would uh, make the book useful to, to a large number of people. So, um, so yeah, if, if you, so thank you to everybody who has read it and thank you to everybody who will read it in the future. Yeah, I, I agree with all your, all your statements. Once again, available on amazon.com. Go and pick it up, people. It's good stuff. So with that said, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap this stream up. Um, Patrick, I'm sure we'll be back here uh, sooner rather than later, to his dismay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> always, always happy to be here. Always oh, I know. I know. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just playing around. Um, but Patrick, thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, we will be back soon with more content. Thank you, everybody who watched at home. And uh, take care of yourselves. Go buy the book and uh go watch some good movies all right you guys take care of yourselves <laughs>